Welcome everyone to Rewind, Recap, Relive, where legends and rising stars meet. I'm your host, Jonah, bringing you another can't-miss episode of the show featuring the killer queen, Kristen DeVille, and Mad Maxine. But first, got to get into the winner of last week's giveaway, our next giveaway, and next week's episode. I'm sure you're all wondering who the winner of last week's giveaway was for the signed copy of Mad Maxine's book, The Chronicles of Mad Maxine. That winner is Lewis McDonald. Congratulations, you're the winner, and as always, we'll be in touch. Now next week on the show, we have a great talent coming at you from Canada being just insane. And who's Justin gonna be on with, you may ask? Well, let me tell you. Justin Sane is gonna be on the show with Jake the Snake Roberts. That's right, WWE Hall of Famer, currently with AEW, the one and only Jake the Snake and Justin Sane on the show. And you have the chance to win this incredible pop figure signed by WWE Hall of Famer Jake the Snake Roberts himself. All you have to do to enter is comment hashtag R3 giveaway down below in the full Kristen DeVille and Mad Maxine episode. That's hashtag R3 giveaway down below in this video and you will be entered to win that incredible pop figure. All right, we've taken care of everything that's on the list. All the boxes are checked. All you guys have to do is please subscribe to the channel. Tons and tons of content on the way here at Rewind Recap Relive. Like the video, share it around. Keep your eyes out for Justin Sane and Jake the Snake Roberts next week's gonna be a great one. But most of all, please enjoy the episode. And before we get into the episode, I got a quick shout out to give to my friends over at Count It Out, Mike and Tyler. Some great content on their channel. They do interviews, countdowns, watch-alongs. So much great content over at their channel. You should totally check them out. You'll see on the screen right here where you can see them. And I'll link it down in the description box below. You might have seen me on their live stream the day of SummerSlam. If you did, thank you. But they're a lot of fun. I really love working with them. And I can't wait to do some collaboration in the future. So check them out. Our first guest is a bit of a veteran in her own right, having 10 years in the business. She's wrestled for numerous promotions and captured championship gold before taking a short break. And after becoming a published author, she's now back making a name for herself in the wrestling world. Please welcome the killer queen, Miss DeVille. Hello. <laughs> and our next guest wrestled during some pretty formidable years uh, in the wrestling business, coming from Camp Moolah and even being managed by Moolah during her career, please welcome Mad Maxine. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I'm so glad awesome. to have you both on the show. And I really like to always start off with something simple and just uh, discuss when your road into the wrestling world really began. And DeVille, I'd love to get your take on it because that's really two different roads, right? So can we hear about your first one, your first journey? Yeah, it, it was uh, 2001. And I was... Uh, I was a wrestling fan, like, in my teenage years, and I went to a lot of wrestling shows at, uh, at the time it was the Times Union Arena, now it's a Pepsi Arena, but um, I remember I was about 15 or 16, I was 15 turning 16, and uh, there was, they did dark matches back then, I don't know if they do them anymore, I, mm -hmm. I haven't really seen many of them, but uh, they would have, like, local talent, like, do matches before, you know, they went on air. And I remember seeing this one guy doing a dark match. He's a big dude. His name is yeah. Dave Danger. He ended up being my trainer eventually. But uh, can I take these off? <laughs> <laughs> I look like a, a bag. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> so, uh his wife was sitting a couple seats over. Okay. I overheard her talking about, yeah, there's a wrestling school near Albany, and that's where I'm from. Well, near Albany. I was like, that is so cool. And I looked into it, and there was an under-18 kids program. And I was 16 at the time. That's unheard of now. You don't hear of people under 18 wrestling anymore. But yeah. back then, you could get away with it. And that's how I, I begged my parents and they knew how much I loved it. So they signed the waiver. Oh, that's so was that, you, you said uh, that that was somebody, uh, was Kenny Casanova involved with that? Yeah, Kenny Casanova was involved with it. He was actually in charge of the, the kids program. He's the one that like made it happen. Yeah, Kenny uh, has been a big influence to me 
all these yeah. years. He he's actually uh, I don't mean to blow his cover, but he's an English teacher, <laughs> so he's he's great with teenagers, and uh, he's a great role model. Before you go on, um, there was of one course. other thing you mentioned, Kristen, um, about your aunt and uncle. Oh yeah, uh, my I, I come from a family of wrestling fans. My dad was a big fan, and my aunt and uncle were huge fans, and they owned a wrestling store, which was pretty cool. Oh, that's so cool. Where was that? Where was that store? They uh, ran it in Schenectady, New York. Okay, yeah. For a while, they uh, went to malls, and like, you know, like in the center of the malls, they had that the store there, and they right. got some pretty cool memorabilia. Like, I've got some pretty cool stuff from them. I remember buying like a pair of Bret Hart sunglasses for like five bucks and they ended up being worth like three hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Were you ever able to see any wrestlers when they had this or was like that one of the ones that did signings or not really? We went to a lot of signings back then. Okay. Uh, Brock Lesnar, Stone Cold. Wow. That's... There, there were others. From uh, a from a fan's perspective that's really cool. Never Never saw anybody like that. That's that's awesome. So you definitely grew up around it. Um, and I'd love to, I want to get back to, because I always think it's an interesting question, what the perspectives of those around you were when you told them you wanted to become a wrestler. But first, I'd love to go to Janine. And um, before Camp Moolah, when was your first journey that you knew you wanted to become a wrestler before you even got to, to Moolah's area? Um, I am different than Kristen in that I, I did not grow up around it. When I had nobody in my family who was into it. I had a college boyfriend who used to get high and eat donuts and watch Gordon <laughs> Soli in college. Yeah. And, um, and I saw like a couple of matches on television. And then um, it was really, um, I, I had gone to journalism school at University of South Florida. Right. And I, for a year and a half, I, I wrote stories about these old people who had accomplished so much. I mean, like rebuilding the telecommunication systems in Germany things on that kind of scale. So they yeah. were like, you know, super impressive. And I was like, nothing. I was like, I hadn't done anything. So I was like, I need to come up with a project. So um, the three, three ideas I had were, I had friends who were in the Renaissance Festival circuit. I thought, well, maybe I could join that and write about it. And then I had a, a friend who was a, a water engineer moving to Chad, Africa. And that was just when Libya was invading Chad. And I thought, well, maybe I could be a you know, foreign, you know, war correspondent. Yeah. Um, and, and then there was um, wrestling. I met a, um, a guy whose mom was a wrestler and I it just never even occurred to me that uh, women, women, I hadn't encountered any women wrestlers and I certainly hadn't encountered women wrestlers who were also moms. So that just blew my mind. And when, when, in, when I met him and then I met her, that was Beverly Shade living in Tampa. Okay. Um, she was super nice and you know she didn't have a ring where she could train me so um, there was a local guy who was training people in an old mattress factory really just like filthy old mattress factory like think about the worst scenario yeah Sex possible before, just <laughs> everywhere and uh, I lasted I think I did went twice and then after that it was just like and you know she said well, you got to call Mula. so um, so that's what I did. Okay. That's amazing that that was like the second option. Like, so was that just known to those who wanted to go into wrestling? Like if you were a women's wrestler, you'd go to Moolah like automatically. Well, I mean, she, Beverly said that, you know, she was the best. Uh, mm -hmm. She was the best in terms of being able to um, train me and also um, to uh, find me work after I was trained. Okay. The funny thing is, and I was telling Kristen this earlier, is like, you know, Lula never trained us. I mean, it was Donna Christiantello who did all the training. And then some of the other, you know, kind of old timers, the veterans um, helped out. Um, but Mula didn't really show up until you, you know, you, I was ready for my first match. And then she kind of worked with me a little bit in the ring, just a couple of the times. So right. it was really, it wasn't really what she did. Well, it's amazing that it just started off as like one of your projects you got as far as you did because the character and, and your persona and your work is still remembered to this day. So, and I'd love to get into the, uh, to the perspectives, like I said, of what those around you thought. When you told your friends, you know, you had your, your three projects or, or maybe your parents at the time, what did they think when you wanted to go into wrestling, Janine? <laughs> the mother's uh, unforgettable quote was, 
the only thing worse you could have done is become a prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> like that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she didn't know anything about it either. And, right. and yeah. so she was worried that I, you know, I didn't have health insurance and she was worried I was going to break my neck and just end up, you know, in, you know, in a, in a bad situation. I, you know, that's what, that's what parents are for. Those, Those are reasonable to- concerns. <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't <laughs> So, um, you know, but I, I wanted to do it as a journalism project. I had a, um, right. I really was interested in like um, getting into something all the way and then being able to write about it instead of like, um, you know, I was doing all these short interviews, like an hour or two hours. And then I'd write about these, you know, these lives that were just so remarkable and um, that I, I just felt like I was cheating them and cheating right. myself just not to give them the, you know, what they were due. So um, I just wanted to get all the way into something. Yeah, no, you definitely immersed yourself in and you were able to come out with a lot of of stories. Yeah. Um, And Kristen, what about you? Did your parents have similar concerns or your friends when you wanted your first run in 2001? Yeah, well, my mom was concerned because I was 16. (laughs) But um, my dad was my biggest supporter. I mean, my mom eventually came around and she loved it. So like all in all, I'd say my parents did support it. They did. They signed the waiver. They let me do it. They knew I loved it. But uh, my mom was a little concerned. She worried for me in the same way Max's uh, mom, you're going to break your neck. My mom has said that countless times. Right, (laughs) because having a wrestling store, they must have known a little bit about what it was right like they knew that there were real risks involved and okay yeah very very nice that they were still supportive though and your friends same thing did they think it was a cool decision oh yeah my friends thought it was real cool (laughs) yeah yeah. mine too yeah yeah and then like there um my parents kind of came around um uh they came around i was in the i was in a territory in the west and i brought a guy who's um he was called the mongolian and he had these very long (laughs) Fu Manchu and it was like my birthday and and we were just you know driving from one shot to another and we stopped off at my parents house in a suburb of Dallas and they just like they were tickled pink <laughs> <laughs> they're like this is cool that's so funny how big was he was he like he was just like a big guy you brought him he over humongous. he was <laughs> very um, impressive person so I, I want to hear about the landscape for women's wrestling when both of you uh, broke into the business, how it looked. Janine, can you go first? Sure. Um, so like I said, I didn't have a, um, a, a background in it. And, uh, you know, all I knew was what Beverly Shade told me. Right. Um, and, and so I didn't, you know, I, I say, okay, let's, let's go to the best to get trained. And at the same time that was going on, um, Cindy Lauper, and uh, Captain Lou Albano and Mula and Wendy Richter were all doing that big thing. It was yeah. rock, rock and roll wrestling and MTV was involved. And all of a sudden, like this huge uh, audience of MTV watchers were now suddenly really involved. And that was kind of happening, but I could never afford uh, cable, could not afford, you know, I never watched MTV. So like, I yeah. was kind of like vaguely aware of it. Um, so that was kind of like the backdrop. So it was getting, it was hot, heating up when mm-hmm. I was getting there. And, uh, and so that's, that was kind of what the, what the, uh, situation was. Did you come in right after WrestleMania one? It was like really like simultaneously. I, I, okay. I'm not sure exactly of the timing of it. It's just that when, um, when Mula started, um, talking to me about my first match, I was, I trained for six months. Um, it was, uh, four hours a day, six days a week for six months. And, wow. um, okay. when, uh, when she started talking to me about wrestling, she mentioned that, you know, I might be considered for, uh, you know, the next person to go up against Wendy and I would be a heel obviously. So, yeah. You know, and, and I don't know, I think maybe that was one of the ideas that she would float to a bunch of other people, because I know that she, she talked to other, other women wrestlers, um, were at the camp um too so not sure how serious it was i certainly wasn't i wasn't at wendy's uh, level i mean i was right you know, very green and she would have just decimated me <laughs> so. 
did all that um, hype and, and the buzz that was uh, surrounding women's wrestling at the time, did that light a fire for you or motivate you? Or even when Moolah said that you were, might go against Wendy, what was the feelings that were going through your head at that time? Um, I, I really hate being told what to do. I mm-hmm. mean, that is just like one of the basic things about me. Do not tell me what to do. And so having Moolah kind of in charge of my life was just something that I just did not feel comfortable about. And right. um, so it didn't really light a fire under me. It was more like um, not wanting to be controlled by a person I didn't trust. That's what was motivating. And so that's, okay. you know, that's what got me up and out of South Carolina and down to Florida. Okay. That's interesting. And DeVille, what would you say is the overall attitude when you broke in in 2001 towards women's wrestling? I'll first start with saying, like, I've always, like, when I watched wrestling in the late 90s and early 2000s, I didn't watch it. I mean, there were a few good women, Lita, Trish, but I didn't yeah. necessarily watch it for the women. I watched it to watch the men wrestle because that is where most of the action was. So, like, when I started wrestling, I had big expectations, and being young, I was severely let down because uh, I've always told people that I wrestled in the wrong era Mm -hmm. which uh, let me try to explain this the best I can Um, yeah I wrestled from 2001 to like 2000 and the beginning of 2009 and that was mostly what called the diva era right and like I said I didn't watch for the I didn't watch the women really I I didn't watch the brown panty matches that's not why I wanted to be a wrestler Mm -hmm. I watched because uh, Stone Cold and Bret Hart and they were my heroes so I guess that was like the vibe back then it was very uh the, the competition is just like insane now there are yeah. so many talented women like back then there were talented women but they're few far in between they were harder to find I was wrestling the same girl every weekend generally wow. and is that and, was that because of lack of women wrestlers in your oh, in, yeah. okay wow wow yeah, yeah. there were few it, there were more in like the cities like we would have to travel me and my tag team partner Kayla at the time we would travel to Boston New Jersey because like in the cities there were more people but like in New York where we're from it was basically me and her and maybe another girl it's so surprising, especially when you look at it right now. But if, and, and it's crazy how that is such recent history, um, yeah. whether it's completely different. Speaking of traveling, Janine, we've, uh, we've had some wrestlers on here in the past talk about those territory days of wrestling. Can you talk about your feelings on those? Obviously, after your run with the, with the WWF, right? Uh, I, I think there was a lot more variety um, and... Uh, you know, people could try really crazy stuff out and, you know, it was just more uh, colorful in a way. I mean, and less packaged, less perfectly packaged like WWE. Uh, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of like Kevin Sullivan, Sullivan and his army of darkness down in Tampa, which yeah. was like amazing. And he just like, he had everybody like, you know, just like eating out of his hand and then, and then, um, uh, Angel Bashan, who became Luna, um, you know, joined up with him. She and I and Peggy had all moved from uh, Columbia to um, South Florida, and eventually up to Tampa, where we where we were able to get work with uh, um, Mike Graham, Mike Graham's company, and Wahoo McDaniel was the booker at the time. So I I don't know. I mean. The road was, you know, it's tiring. You yeah. uh, you work, uh, you grab a wine cooler and drive to the next uh, place. And, you know, I mean, sometimes I was driving by myself, sometimes with people and, you know, I didn't share a room. So it was, you know, if, if I shared a room, it would have been a lot more doable because um, it was, it was expensive, you know, so you, you right. yeah. Pay, 
50 or 75 bucks for the shot, but then spend, I don't know what, on our hotel room and food. And so you're not really making very much money. I mean, it, it got better over time for sure. Right. I think that's why a lot of the guys who've said it, like um, we had Brutus Beefcake on the show and he was talking a lot about how if you didn't, you know, if you didn't sell tickets, you really didn't eat a lot. It was really independent. You were in it for yourself or, or with a partner, maybe traveling on the road. So I think maybe that's why it gets pegged with that negative light sometimes. So you, you more so enjoyed it when things were going your way at least. Uh, you know, I just, I just think, I think it's, um, it's not that I necessarily enjoyed the actual, you know, road, but I, I did enjoy the fact that there were territories that you could move from all over the U.S. And I think, right. I think strength, and I think it's a weakness when you have one corporation gobbling up ever all the competition. I don't think that's great. And it's, it seems like there are territories coming back. Is that right? I all would say so. Making a way. Kristen, would you say that? Yeah, I I, w I would say there's a the WWE is WWE, but there is some competition coming up. Yeah, definitely. You know, get a foothold. I, I just think that's really a, a good thing. And you know, more competition. You know, then then they have to up their game even more. And more talent, more competition, more talent. Yeah, more diversity, more craziness. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No, competition, I feel is good for everyone. I think the more the more corporations there are, the more people get shots and, and the more uh, the product betters, right? So Janine, I've heard you say that wrestling at first was very challenging for you. Can you speak a little bit about that and how you overcame those challenges? Sure. Well, um, I didn't, you know, I'm, I'm very tall. I'm six foot two and right. Taller so than me. I, and I never like did gymnastics when I was a kid. And so and, you know, I just had such a hard time learning how to do a bump. Uh, mm -hmm. Just the simplest move that you need to know. And I just did it like time after time. After, you know, it, it took me two weeks, you know, four hours a day, six days a week. And I and like to, to achieve even like my first bump. And it was, you know, part of it is that, you know, it's, it seems like a simple thing, but you know, when you, when you do a back bump, you're, you have to keep your head off the mat. You have to spread your arms out. You have to have your knees up and uh, you know, you have to step off on your right foot. And that sounds like, Oh yeah, no problem. But then in the, you know, at the same time, I was like trying to protect myself from like, you know, getting hurt. And so then I would right. screw it up. You know, you have to actually just kind of forget about that part and you have to forget about pain and you have to forget about, you know, being worried about getting hurt. You just have to throw yourself into it. And that's kind of, that's eventually what I came to. You just have to like give it up and just go for it. And was there a moment when you realized that you had it, like it clicked in your head? Do you remember? Yeah, I, I was thinking about something completely else. And <laughs> just like, you know, I was kind of sequestered off to, you know, the, there were, there was a whole training thing that was going on in this part of the ring. And then I was over here with another person who was also really bad. And, um, and I was, you know, just, you know, just making us do it one after another, after another. And I just, you know, at, at a certain point, I just like shut my brain off and then my body took over. And then like, once you do it once, you kind of get that kinetic knowledge that, yeah. you know, like, this is how my body feels when I do this. And so once I did it once, I was able to kind of replicate it. And then it was fine. I could do it right now, except that I wouldn't because it would hurt too much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. So it sticks with you then um, after you learn it, I think, right? And Kristen, do you, do you resonate with that at all? <laughs> that, that's what I'm going. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. It, it, it all sticks with you up here. You you remember, uh, but <laughs> ten years later, uh, your body feels a little different. You know, right? Take it again. Definitely a different story now, like physical wise. Right. And do you know what your biggest struggle was? Do you think you could you could pinpoint that if you had any? Like uh, when I started back up? Um, yeah, that's interesting. Let's, yeah, both times. So the first time when you first broke into it, was it more like intimidation or, or struggling with maybe the bumps? Or? Yeah, it's like I worry more about like uh, getting hurt now than I did back then, for sure. I uh, was more daring when I was younger. I right. didn't really, and that allowed me to do the moves. Like she said, don't think about it, just do it. And that's, yeah. 
and this time around, you know, I'm like, oh God, <laughs> am I going to make it? Am I going to, you know, uh, it's a little different. Um, I would say just like m the change in my body, I'm not a little stick figure anymore. I'm, yeah. I was 16 to my early 20s when I wrestled my first time. I was, I was small, smaller mm -hmm. than the other girls. And now I'm a 34 year old woman and my body is different and I can definitely feel it. Yeah. And, and let's come full circle then. Cause you were the first ever from, from those first, you know, feelings of, of trepidation, you were the first ever world of hurt women's champion, right? In 2004. Yes. So that, so that's really good. That's a great accomplishment and congratulations, of course belated but um how did that feel when a company chose to put that belt on you so early on in your career you were three years into it what did that feel like it felt great i was only 18 or going on 18 i had been training uh those years with them that i that was the wrestling school i went to i was one of their two girls that trained there it was a surprise no it seems you know? it would have been an amazing feeling yeah I'm sure. And wh who was it against? Do you remember who you beat? Yeah, uh, she eventually became my tag team partner. Her name's Kayla oh, wow, Clark. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's we, great. we had a tag team called the Diva Killers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's perfect for the time period. It really is. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, but she's the girl I wrestled like every weekend back then, and uh, of course they put me heel, and she was face. Yeah. She even younger than me she was uh two years younger than me so like when i was like 18 she was 16 so yeah we were really young yeah we training wrestling school right and does she still does she still wrestle no <laughs> no not anymore actually when i made my comeback last year she actually came out of retirement and did the first my first match back with me oh that's that's so, so great that's what i was going to ask about yeah if you two would ever yeah. start it back up oh that's yeah, great the, the one with the godfather i told you about yesterday yeah yeah exactly oh that's nice oh th so you both worked with the godfather yeah nice He's awesome. <laughs> that's great yeah and janine so you wrestled from 1984 to 1986 right and can you talk a little bit about why it was so short-lived? I know you said that it was just going to be a project for you. Um, and are you satisfied with, with how long it did end up being? Yeah, I, I actually am uh, completely happy to have had it be that long. Um, it, was, it was long enough for me to uh, get the feeling like I'd really done, I'd done it. I, I, I was... Um, I wanted to know what my point of no return was. Mm -hmm. And that point of no return came in New Orleans uh, after uh, the day after getting ripped off at a, uh, a Houston arena and, and then getting injured and then having my, uh, you know, I had my costume, uh, uh, my wrestling gear uh, stolen um, the night before. So I had to go out and uh, I went to a thrift stores in uh, New Orleans and found a drum majorette outfit that was like very sparkly. And I yeah. went to somebody's uh, hotel room and duct taped it on my body and spray painted it. And like, uh, I didn't really trash the room terribly, but it was a little bit. Um, so, um, so I was wrestling Dark Journey and uh, she potatoed me uh, really hard and my outfit fell down. And I'd always made like so... I was always so careful. I was not going to be the, uh, it was, it was horrendous. I was not going to be the one who had their, like, you know, the malfunction. I, I like every right. costume I ever made and I made them all. Um, they were like, <laughs> you could have put a bomb underneath them. They would not fall <laughs> off, except for this one time. And that was, but like, it wasn't your fault, right? Cause the original well, gear got I stolen. Think, it was like it just, you know, it just happened right. because of, of, of getting ripped off and then having to do a makeshift thing and it was just like you know it, it's really kind of you know that moment where you just say okay this is it that I'm not doing anything more I have done this I am done and uh and then I got on the bridge and went the wrong way home <laughs> <laughs> driving along and like, damn it damn it it was like 
you know, I, 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 that was basically, you know, I just, I just wanted to have the full experience. Uh, I, I never claimed to be a great wrestler. I, you know, there are many, many women who are much better than I am at, or right. ever were. I had a, I had a, a the advantage of, of a good look. Um, you know, definitely did. Yeah. The mohawk. By the way, I spent half an hour trying to get my hair in a mohawk for for this interview tonight. <laughs> I meant to. I meant to ask. You. Oh, that's such a shame. That would have been so I cool. I know. Well, it's because I haven't had my hair cut in, since the beginning of the pandemic, and it's same. Just yeah. Like wool. <laughs> that would have been so cool. Yeah, I understand though. I know. I definitely. Got, I don't think I'd ever be able to do that. How long did it take on average before the match? You know, um, it was it was shorter and it was permed, uh, so it really didn't take very long at all. Right. The problem was um, shaving the sides. I could do everything myself except for this one strip back here, and so I'd have to find somebody to help me with that. I couldn't. I couldn't like, you know, see behind myself. So um, I did remember one time I was. Uh, I was in, in uh, DC visiting uh, uh, my sister and I had borrowed a friend's car and was zipping back from National Airport, dropping somebody off and yeah. I got pulled over for, for speeding. And the guy, you know, the policeman uh, was like, uh, you know, you were speeding. And I was like, oh, you know, I haven't, I'm, I'm just waking up. And I just haven't had a cup of coffee. I haven't had a chance to even shave my mohawk yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that was enough of a like, you know, weird thing to say. Right. Okay, you can go, <laughs> go on. Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Well, can you talk a little bit about? So you, I, I'm just curious myself. So you got your gear uh, stolen? Was that at the arena or before the show? Or you know, usually I would. Um, my my usually there was not an extra dressing room like separate from the men. So right. um, I was usually you know I would like go into a bathroom off the men's thing and, and put my gear on, and you know the men were just walking with everything flopping all around and um and uh so i didn't i didn't care i just you know just didn't look i i didn't it didn't bother me um but this was one of the only time actually that um uh, they they didn't have a, a room for me that locked or was you know behind security and they just had me like out there Man, I lost I lost so much. It was just terrible. Like a camera, my journal. Um, so they stole so, your whole suitcase. Yeah. Or, they, or I'm assuming, right? Wow. Everything. Yeah, it was really terrible. bad. Terrible. I, I um, it was like the only reason I got through that night was the um, I had a friend, um, still a friend, Bruce Tharp. He was a referee at the time, and he like you know he I was freaking out, and he talked me down, and he kind of like calmed me down, and yeah, and you know, helped me out the next day. So thank goodness for friends. Yeah, really. No, that, that would be enough for anybody to go over the edge, I think. So how did that come about your final moment in the wrestling world? You just, you just drove away. Who'd you tell? Was there anyone in particular? Oh yeah. I told the booker. I, I was, uh, you said I, was you're just, done. I was just like, you know, this is, this is it. And, and, you know, that was fine. It was, uh, you know, the timing was, interesting in that my uh, sister uh, was getting married in DC. And so I was, you know, I was intending to go to her wedding anyway. So it was just like the, you know, I was going yeah. to head out anyway and then come back. But then I just like, okay, that's it. I'm, I'm, so I just moved back to DC and, uh, you know, uh, eventually got a job in, in moved to Boston to, mm -hmm. to be with a guy I was interested in. In, interested in and worked for a uh, black newspaper up there. Um, I had, I had uh, uh, worked for the black news in Columbia, South Carolina. <clears throat> um, uh, I had done a freelance assignment for uh, them covering a Klan rally because they were afraid about sending their report. I heard about that. Yeah. And how was that experience like that? It was really, you know, I, I, it was an eye opener. I mean, just to, like to, to hear, you know, there was, a, it was a, a uh, group from North Carolina, a paramilitary group, was trying to come down to South Carolina and recruit people to start this like army. And right. they were going to build big, big property and a million acres. And they were going to like, you know, it was going to be white land. And uh, and just to, you know, they did the cross burning and they had the, you know, the pointy hats. And, uh, you know, and I didn't tell them I was with the Black News. I thought that was probably not a good idea. No. But they had, um, Columbia had, um, 
had been really smart about it. They'd, they'd put out, they'd given the permit, but they made them have it way out outside of town. So, uh, and they had brought in a lot of police um, to make sure that nothing got out of hand. So, Good. I mean, it was, it was awful to hear the things that they were saying. Um, I mean, I was raised in the military. My dad was in the army and, you know, I've been raised to believe that, you know, you, you don't discriminate and, you know, you don't, you don't say the kinds of things that the, uh, you know, the uh, clan assholes were saying. And, yeah. you know, it just kind of took the top of my head off. Um, and, uh, and I was a little bit afraid to put my byline on the story, but I went ahead and did it anyway. And, and uh, was concerned that they were going to come after me. They did not, but uh, you know, I had I had a momentary like. Right, as up. anyone would. Yeah, well, that's that's a crazy. That's a really crazy experience. Very um, brave. Yeah, and very brave. Uh, Deville, can you talk a little bit about now why it is that the women's revolution brought you back into wrestling? I just think it's so interesting that you had that ten year break, um, and of course, published author. But why is it that the um, that brought you back into the women's revolution? What about it inspired you? First, before we get into that, I just wanna say pineapple. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'm unaware of what the, That's amazing, yeah. No, I love all these little things. Are there any more? <laughs> Maybe. I guess I'll have to wait and see, okay. Um, yeah, I was <laughs> watching last year, I was like starting to get back into it had moved back from home and I didn't really have a lot going on so I started watching again slowly watching like old stuff first and then I started watching the new stuff and I saw like the girls were getting a major push yeah. and like they were having their own pay-per-views they were being main evented and then I like went down the rabbit hole and started watching matches on YouTube of you know uh independent women wrestlers and yeah. and even the male ones now and there's some that still wrestle that wrestled with me back then like that are you know doing still stuff going, now yeah Mercedes Martinez I wrestled with her all the time she, really uh, and now she's in NXT uh yeah there's some that really went with it and I think that's awesome, but that is that's so cool, and it and so it definitely motivated you to get back into yourself, right? Yeah, the motivation was mainly like it was making me smile again. I yeah. didn't want to like before. I was very motivated to make it. Now I just want to have fun, and I am still smiling, so I know I'm doing my job. And absolutely. I mean, that's yeah. why I got back into it. It's making me smile again. I, I've met a lot of wonderful people. I wanted to ask you, what's the crown? Yeah, I want to I want to ask you about the crown. That is a really awesome crown. My evil crown. Oh, <laughs> and, and it goes with your, does it go with your persona? Yeah, this is what I wear out in the ring. I mean, I take the it off queen? before I wrestle. Right, the killer queen, yeah. Ah, killer queen, that's what I was looking for. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Janine, do you still watch wrestling? Do you ever watch it? Do you know about the women's revolution? Have you heard about it? What's happening? No, I actually didn't. And I'm really actually excited to hear about that from uh, Kristen when I, when she and I were talking, I was like, I had no idea. And I think it's great. I mean, especially the fact that the women are so well-trained and doing, you know, really these, you know, intense, you know, very acrobatic, you know, kind of the, the things that were more what the men used to do. Yeah. Less what women used to do. And, and also less emphasis on the TNA, you know, like more about wrestling and less about, you know, you know, the sex appeal. Yeah. I right. mean, nothing yeah. wrong with sex appeal. Sex appeal, I have no problem with that. It's just like the extremes they were taking it to back then. It was borderline degrading to the women. Right. They didn't take it, they didn't take women's wrestling as seriously. Sex appeal is fine. Uh, everyone wants to feel pretty. So Janine, I'd like to get into now the time that you spent with uh, the legendary, but also controversial, uh, fabulous Moolah. And so what were your feelings when you first did arrive at, uh, at Camp Moolah? What were, can you describe the mood and the image to us? And Sure. I mean, I, it was um, uh, it was a really pretty property. It was 35 acres in the middle of a suburb, uh, suburb of Columbia, 
which right. you know you never expect that that would you know that would be there and um uh all um, the women lived all you know we all lived in these converted army barracks except for there was like one trailer um that actually luna lived in um and uh I would say that the trainees, the people who were getting trained, were friendly with each other. Um, uh, Luna was and I were, were trainees, and and there was a little bit of interaction with the um, with the veterans, the people who've been wrestling for a long time, who are actually going out on the road and having matches. Right. Um, but there was um, kind of this unspoken thing of just don't smarten up the trainees. So um, you know they were kayfaving us like. And, and like would like shut down if we passed by them and they were talking about something. And eventually um, I became friends with Peggy, um, Peggy Fowler and, and uh, you know, she kind of sparked me up. Um, but I just thought it was like, you know, I, I mean, it was ludicrous to like, you know, they wouldn't, they taught you all the moves uh, and made you do them again and again, but they would not teach you selling until your first match was, uh, was booked. So, you wouldn't like actually know how to put the, put the wow. moves together. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, so, and so like, <clears throat> there was also for me, uh, my perception was that, um, that there was kind of like a grapevine, like people, you know, were like reporting back to Moolah about different things that were going on that were like against the rules. It felt like there were spies everywhere. It did not feel like a safe environment. Um, so I ended up, um, you know, I had I, I had uh, I had some friends uh, on the camp in the camp, but then I also made you know I, I ended up you know making friends in in town as well. So you know I kind of felt like I needed like some normalcy because there was it was just a weird world you know where like you know I just didn't feel like there were too many trustworthy people there, and and you know partly because I was on the outside of the group because I was I was a a, a, a trainee they didn't know if I was going to finish. You know, I can understand it, um, but it, it was it was uncomfortable, and right. uh, you know, that's that. Yeah, and Deville, can you explain your how you began your journey when you were training? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, like that, I I do understand. Uh, there are a lot of bad apples in wrestling. You, you mm -hmm. can't really fully trust many people. So I, I totally understand that. Uh, the difference was she trained uh, mainly with a bunch of women. There weren't any women I trained with. So I had to, you know, I mean, the main, like, negative things that I dealt with were, like, sexism and yeah. things like that. You know, I was underage at the time, too, like... And you know there were bad apples there, not all of them. And uh, Kenny Casanova certainly was one of the great ones. He was very good to me, and he kept me away from the bad eggs. I can yeah. say that he took me under his wing, and so did a few others. But um, I remember wrestling, you know, training, and we were doing body slams and. This guy, unfortunately, passed away, but he, he would, like, touch the woman inappropriately, and my dad caught it, because my dad used to watch me train, and he was like, I don't like the way that guy grabbed you. He goes, yeah. and I'm like, Dad, it's wrestling. You have to, it's a contact sport, but later I figured out he liked the younger girls, you know? Like, I was like, oh, there's some truth to this. This is scary. This is scary that it's happening to me, but... um. Yeah, that, those are the main things I dealt with. Uh, that was why I left the mattress factory, mainly because uh, I was getting groped by the other trainees. And it's like, yeah. dude, that's not happening. So, yeah. yeah. It, it, there is a way to handle women uh, when given body slams. And it's not grabbing them like you do a, a man. That there's different ways to do it for a male and a female. Well, I'm sorry for that, for those experiences. No, yeah, sounds, sorry to get you more. No, not at all. <laughs> it's just, are there any, do you remember any um, fun experiences or, 
or were, was it mainly, was your training experience mainly not? No, it, there was more fond experiences than negative experiences. I don't know. I, I don't know why I went that route first, but. No, um, it's totally fine. Whatever, you know, comes to your mind. It was, it, it was fun training with the kids. Like, uh, I, uh, I grew up with a, a, a number of wrestlers that still wrestle till today because mm-hmm. we trained together from when we were 16. So yeah. I've known some of these people since I was a kid and I still know them now. So that, that, that part is awesome. It was like going to high school with yeah. people you didn't go to high school with. It, <laughs> is a, of its own. There were, it was mostly good times. Well, that's and good. Uh, yeah, most of the people at my wrestling school were, they were, they were good. There's a few bad eggs, but there's bad eggs everywhere. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So one of the things that both Kristen and I love, love, love is the theatrical, the costuming. That is the stuff that I absolutely love. You know, like coming up with a persona, getting the mohawk, coming up with the costume, and just like all that stuff in the ring. That was really fun. Can you speak about that a little bit? I know that, did that happen at, um, when you were with Moolah, you came up with your persona of Mad Maxine? Yeah, I was, I was, I was moving into six months of training and I was like getting really tired of like doing the same stuff every day. Yeah. And, and I knew that Mula, in fact, when we first met, <clears throat> Mula had said that, you know, her girls had, were skinny and had long hair and, um, and my hair was, has always been short. Um, it just doesn't get long. Um, so, um, but I just knew that I needed to get her off the dime. So, um, the fella I was dating in Columbia uh, was a comic book uh, fan, and he showed me um, an X-Men comic with an African-American superhero, and she had a mo- white mohawk, which she was named Storm, you know, and then very much like biker gear, very strong, very kick-ass, and I thought, yeah. that's it, and, uh, and, and so I just wanted, without talking to Mulo or talking to anybody, actually, I just you know, it's like, I'm just going to do this. And um, I got, you know, razzed a little bit. She wasn't very, you know, she called me down and talked to me about, you know, that, you know, well, I really screwed the pooch and, you know, this is, this is you know, I should have talked to her first, but, you know, it's like, I just, you know, wanted to, t- you know, want to have control over my own destiny and, right. and also control over my name, you know, because, uh, you know, you could get be given a really terrible name if you didn't come up with your own own ideas. You know, somebody's going to put their own shitty ideas on top of you. So yeah, I grew up. So, <laughs> so um, and then really, uh, it was very soon after that I uh, I did get my first match. So it was um, it was you know in retrospect it was the 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 best thing I could have done because she was kind of like forced to do something with me instead of me just doing these endless moves Mm -hmm. and do you what do you think about the uh the recent negative light that's been cast over moolah's name uh, and how it's kind of come about social media and everything of course the the battle royal a couple years ago changed the name what did you think about all that you know uh, moolah is is dead and gone Um, right and and i i feel sorry for her daughter who continues to have to kind of push back on you know, the stories about what Moolah did uh, or didn't do. And I find it really, um, you know, peculiar that people who have no firsthand knowledge want to weigh in and mm-hmm. defend her. And it's like, dude, you weren't there. You're a guy and you weren't there. So <laughs> shut up. Um, and, um, you know, I did have firsthand knowledge. She did try to get me to go out to see this guy and you know, in the West. And, you know, he did want to take pictures of me, but it was clear that he wanted to, you know, wanted to have sex with me. And uh, I wasn't the only one. He was like, this was a guy who everybody knew about. And, you know, she, she did not force me to do anything. I would have, you know, would, would have quit immediately. But um, I was, you know, I said no, and she didn't press it. So that was right. to her favor. Um, but, you know, I just think the the problem was really I think you know consenting adults great go for it, um, but uh, what I saw as a problem was I was aware of a, 
uh, young wrestlers who were underage, who were Kristen's age when you started out, who she was sending out. And mm -hmm. I didn't think that was okay. And she was doing it with trainees who, uh, you know, didn't know any better, didn't know, didn't have enough, um, were still naive and didn't realize that the world is full of sharks and that, you know, these little lambs could just get eaten up. So, um, you know, I, I don't harbor any ill will toward her. I, you know, she's, as I say, she's gone. She did what she did. And um, she, you know, she had her reasons, you know, being raised in very, very poor um, environment, uh, you know, wanted to make sure she never had to, um, you know, go hungry again. But um, I don't think that justifies it. I mean, I think you, I think you have to have uh, good morals and values, uh, regardless of your personal circumstances. By the way, I want to That's say one great. more. Yes, go on. Dirty Lou. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> oh, that's great. That's fantastic. Oh, what was the word? Guardy Lou. Guardy Lou. Okay, I'm not sure what you it is. You don't want to know. I know. You don't want to know what it means. Oh, I'm oblivious. It's, 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 uh, it's I just learned word. that word today. It's the British <laughs> word, which um, they would in in uh, in the olden days, uh, people would throw their you know the the poop and pee out of their piss pots from under their beds. They'd throw it outside their windows. But first they'd yell, Guardy Lou! And they'd throw it out onto the pave, onto the cobblestones below. Right. And then they'd let the pigs out and the pigs would come eat up all the shit. And that, oh, okay. Well, this this interview has gone in a lot of different directions and moves <laughs> and fluctuations. I told you you didn't That's want great. to know, but you wanted to know your your boa you know i think that right your um oh, yeah super yours cool. goes so well with your your whole theme and that's that goes into what i just want to talk about now can you tell us how the the um killer queen miss deville how did that you know or what are the origins of that how did that develop oh the, uh so my favorite band is queen <laughs> Let me, uh, my, my cat is named freddie mercury uh, in, <laughs> yeah. so my favorite band of all time is Queen, so that was definitely my main inspiration. And I'm like, you know, I want like something else besides Miss Deville. I want something to yeah. be known by. And I wanted to change the gimmick a little because, you know, I was a baby face when I was younger and I'm I'm one of the older women in wrestling now. So I was like, uh, it's gotta be heelish because yeah. I'm probably gonna yeah. be heel a lot. And I came up with the Killer Queen, and it just turned into this. <laughs> and you <laughs> like being a right? I love being you. <laughs> yeah. Why do you, you like it? I yeah. love being baby face. Why did you like it? It comes more naturally to me, honestly. Ah. <laughs> it does, like, no, even, like, just, like, talking to the audience or just cutting a promo, it just comes easier to me, being evil or uh, you know, mean right. <laughs> i know that's horrible <laughs> you seem so sweet no, though, yeah. like they really said it's a theatrical thing you know uh, like, okay. all right i don't you wear this crown yeah. all day <laughs> Can you talk about uh, the the kayfabe that existed back in in the eighties compared to now? Because I'm sure that being a heel back in the eighties compared to now, it's just a whole different level of of commitment. I'd say in terms of you know outside of the ring. Can you talk about that? God, it was everything. I mean, it had started. The, there were starting to be some cracks in in it. Um, in you know, and, but um, it was pounded into us. Protect the business. Protect the business. And yeah. if you didn't, you were really, you know, that was just so not okay. And to the point where like, I mean, that's one of the reasons it took me so long to write the Chronicles of Mad Maxine, the book that I just published. Yes. Um, is I just, I, you know, part of me was like still in that mindset, like you don't, you don't talk about the business, even though, you know, that's completely, you know, everybody knows it's not. That's it's the window. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, bye-bye. So, um, and, and, and the other reason was, I, you know, why it took me so long, um, more than 30 years to write the damn book, um, is because I became friends with the wrestlers and I like, I didn't want to like do an expose. I didn't want to out anybody. I didn't want to, you know, I wasn't trying to do any gotcha journalism. I wanted to do yeah. 
you know, just kind of like what the experience was for me, which is what I ended up writing. You know, it's, 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 it's a, a novel based on what my experiences were um, just, just during the time in Colombia. But I'm planning right. on writing another one and it's going to oh, really? be about, yeah, it's going to be about an all women wrestler vigilante group. Who, and we go around or they go around, I shouldn't say we, um, <laughs> and they find, you know, women and kids who are having a hard time, domestic abuse, child abuse, whatever it is. And they, um, they stand up to the, you know, to the bullies and they, you know, right the wrongs and, uh, and then, uh, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff happens. Wow. And this, this seems like the perfect time. Of course, the Chronicles of Mad Maxine is Janine's book and DeVille, you published one as well on your 10 year break, right? Can you talk about your book a little bit? It's called, I actually have it right here. Yeah, yeah show it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's called How to Kill a Man. Uh, it's a fiction book. It's uh, got suspense, romance. Uh, it's something that took me 10 years to write. I know you said it. They're not easy to write, are they? What's Sim that? Similarities. The books are not easy to write. No, they're not. Oh my God. No. Brutal. No. <laughs> uh, but it's on Amazon under Christian DeVille which is my first name. Right. All right, well, congratulations to both of you on those books. Uh, and I just have a few more questions before we head out here. Um, and so Janine, when you first got into it, it was right around, you said that uh, rock and wrestling time. And I'd love right. to know how Vince McMahon was, if you had any interaction with him, just because so many people have stories of him now, um, you know, and you have that unique perspective of him early on. You know, I did meet him. Uh, uh, I had two matches with WWF. Right. And uh, uh, Susan Starr and Desiree Peterson were the two matches I had. And I did meet, uh, I, I met Vince Jr., but um, I had a, a meeting with, my, my main meeting was with, you know, Moolah, of course. Yeah. And Gorilla Monsoon. And they offered me a contract, which I um, did not sign. Um, because I had been trained not to sign anything I don't read. And, smart, uh, smart, yeah. smart, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I didn't. I don't have actually any any feedback on Vince. I mean, I I think that uh, I you know just kind of wish that Mula hadn't had such a stranglehold on women's right. wrestling, and that you know more people had been allowed to shine. I think I think Wendy was uh, shafted. Um, you know, I think she should have held the belt. And uh, that didn't happen. I mean, you know, she with, Mula yeah. needed to step aside. You know, she was getting older, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I have a lot of admiration for the fact that she was still taking bumps in her 70s and 80s. I mean, geez, can't even imagine doing it today, much less 20 years from now. How about how about the backstage um, camaraderie that existed either in WWF or or in the other territories that you were in? Was it a strong like family connection? I would not say so. Um, I mean, I think uh, um, what surprised me, you know, like when we were getting ready to do the the shots in uh, Poughkeepsie, which is where WWF used to do their um, TV, um, you know, everybody's like, you know, kind of backstage standing in the curtains and, and you know, you'd get like a little handshake and wrestlers shake hands. I don't know if everybody knows this, but they shake yeah. hands like very, very lightly. Like, you know, oh, like wow. A, no, I didn't know that. It's like a 97-year-old accountant who's just come out of a coma <laughs> it, it's, it's like it's kind of like really um so you know but um back then like hulk was there wendy was it was there yeah um you know there were the, the big names who were working for wwf at the time so um but i would not say um there was like a family feeling about it i think you know it's it's a hard business and i think um you know I, I think there's a lot of um, egotism, you know, and and people like, you know, you know, men who are interested in finding out, you know, what arena rats are available after the matches. And, right. um, you know, and I wouldn't say it was a healthy environment either. I think, you know, there was a lot of cocaine back in those days and, um, you know, a lot of steroids. I don't know if that's different now, but um, I would not say that it was a warm, fuzzy world. No, 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 no.
did you did you feel like wrestling uh wrestling people have been like family uh like tight like family or kind of more like individuals out for themselves uh right now it's more family oriented more than ever i would say uh oh. yeah uh, the rest themselves not the people that not the fans no no the wrestlers themselves yeah uh you know there are people the, the business has always been like a dog eat dog world so there there's always going to be people like that but no a lot of them are like a lot of them are family men and uh you know uh when you said the 80s like the first thing i think of is like with wrestling is like the steroids it, like when you said that i was like oh yeah yeah uh it's not so much like that anymore it's my knowledge i mean it could be happening behind my back i don't know but i i don't see much of it as i did even like 15 years ago when i did this which was they were they were doing it around that time are, are wrestlers juicing as much as they used to no no, no very little no. of them yeah i i don't see much of it. it in the independent circuit not much at all uh i don't know what goes on in the big leagues i right i hear they test i don't <laughs> know what goes on uh but no there's That's i don't like see a lot league. of it it, a lot of uh there's a lot of uh alternatives now for people that want to get fit there's yeah. legal ways to go about it and uh i think a lot of people choose that path now because like wrestlers were dropping like flies like when i wrestled i know, you had, wrestler, I know. you had a wrestler dying every other week right exactly and because of all the drugs so be really careful, okay? I'm not your mom, but I just want you to be really careful out there. Thank you. <laughs> I will. I promise you. Okay, good. But <laughs> right before we get into the last two questions, um, I want to know, Janine, did you watch the uh, that Moolah episode? I was curious that from Dark Side of the Ring, or did um, they contact you also? Yeah, yeah. I was actually part. supposed to be on it, but um, I had a. A uh, trip overseas already planned and couldn't reschedule, and it just didn't okay. work out. In fact, you know, I I am always going to step aside for the wrestlers who uh, worked for ten or twenty years. Um, right, you know, right. People, they talk to me. I want them to talk to the, you know, the the longtime you know wrestlers because they've got the experience. Um, I I thought that they kind of captured it, um, but you know, there was still like some hedging about like, oh, you know. Nobody pimped me out. It was like, oh yeah, but I went to the, I went to, uh, I don't even remember the Netherlands, and the guy was like, I don't, I don't even remember. But it's just like, you know, it's like there, it's all been kind of centered on this one issue, mm -hmm. but that wasn't really, that was just one thing uh, in a lot of other kind of abusive things where, you know, she was not paying people and right. and and just being, you know, just a a, a, a just a horrible person. So, you know, but you know, it's all water under the bridge. Right. It's it's old stuff. And um and Deville, so what do you see for your future? Real open ended question. It is because uh I don't have a concrete answer. Most people probably don't for something like that. Yeah. You have some matches coming up? Yeah, I have a match on Saturday yes. against a wrestler named Nakomatala. Uh, in Are Rhode Island. Crass? Yes. <laughs> Are you going to kick it so hard? I'm going to get the queen's hand. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's, um, so that's great in the immediate future. And what, what is that for? What promotion is that for? Uh, that is for New Extreme Wrestling Association. It's in Rhode Island. Nice. And, uh, yeah. It's uh, it's gonna be my first time working there. Um, okay. But yeah. Uh, as for long term goals, I don't really have any concrete ones. I just want to have fun. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't mind winning a title in my future, but you know, we'll see. You know. <laughs> yeah. 
down the road. Yeah, you never, you never know what's yeah. happening down then. And Janine, last question. Do you have any advice as DeVille continues her career in the ring? Do you have any advice for her? I'm sorry. I just need to make a correction. It's New World Wrestling Extreme. I'm sorry. Okay. I said- no problem. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they'll see it before the match, so it's. <laughs> I feel like I had the wording off. Yeah, um, I would say I, I think that's really cool that um, Kristen, that you um, have written one book, and you know, I know it, it took you a long time, not as long as me, but it took you a long time. <laughs> I'd say um, I think that's like a really nice balance with the wrestling. It's like when you're not wrestling to you know channel that you know, your energy and creativity into that other world. I think that's just so smart to do. So you have like more than one thing going. And I, I would, the only thing I would say is just like, write another damn book. I did. I, I <laughs> wanted, <laughs> yeah, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm working on my second book. It's almost done. So awesome. yeah, I should be publishing a book early next year. I would say if all oh. goes well. Writing and wrestling go hand in hand for me. They're both like big gloves of mine. What's That's the amazing. book about? What's yeah, the, tell us. You, you, you know, as an author, how you hate describing your own book. Your elevator speech. <laughs> Five words. It's uh, about a girl that makes a very big mistake when she's uh, the night of her graduation and she ends up hitting a woman and killing her and she ends up going to prison for manslaughter and when she gets out like seven years later uh she uh has to like rebuild her life again and she ends up meeting a guy and that's all i'm gonna say uh, okay the guy ends up being someone pretty important and it all ties in together I, oh wow <laughs> it, Does it have? Yeah. I guess the title would be too much to give away, right? You don't want to give away the title. Help the poor girl. Okay. And Janine, yeah. what what about your book? Do you know what yours will be called yet? Or no, I actually uh, t- coming up with titles is like the worst thing for me. I just have. It to I can believe it. Yeah. No, I don't know. It, it could be like you know, all women wrestler vig- vigilante group. I I have no real real idea. Right. Untitled. <laughs> yeah, so far. So, yeah, I'm just working on it. I, I meet with a, another writer every week and we, we uh, read each other what we've written the previous week and kind of keep each other on track. That's really great to get the creative juices flowing, right? That's Absolutely. great. Got to, got to. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for coming on. Uh, that brings us to the end. Good luck to both of you in your, in your writing endeavors and Kristen in your career. Good luck. Thank you so much, guys. It's Thanks been a for pleasure. having us. Woo, message daddy. Booga wooga man feel good. I tell my people and my brothers and sisters, don't you dare, don't you dare miss online. Rewind, recap, relive. Oh yeah.